where I essentially address what I call the youth choir basic training um, and really it just became a, a platform for us to, to go through uh, so many of the aspects of, of, of this, this establishing and having a successful youth choir. Um, uh, whether it's from rehearsal technique, dreaming, planning, working with your ministers on, on staff. Um, and then the second session we just finished was with regards to, to developing a lifelong uh, uh, act of worship or, or youth who we feel are, will be worshiping faithfully in the years and decades to, uh, to come. Um, this session is going to focus on what we know to be an ever-present issue. We're all changing. We are all always changing. Um, so let's paint the picture. Here we go. You ready? You just had your mountaintop Jan June choir tour experience. I mean, the choir has never sounded better. You have rehearsed some of these anthems all year, and they've got to memorize. There's some emotional, spiritual connection that takes place. Tears. It is just, this is the best choir tour ever. That's in June. And you don't see those poor kids until the Sunday after Labor Day, right? Because they've had their other mission trip, or they've got their other camps, and <coughs> the parents travel for a month to wherever, or who knows? Uh, they've had summer school, they've grown two inches, and they walk in that, that, that rehearsal room, and you look at them, they all got tans, they've got tattoos on each other. <laughs> um, and who are you? They are not the same person. It's funny. And actually, it's something we, we should talk about this maybe later at the end of the session, but I love to think of creative ways to stay engaged with youth during those doldrum July, August, these months. Because I feel like so often I get, I'm like, man, if I could just shoot in their arm with the experience we have in June, somewhere in October or November when they're hard to see, they can't see that they can't see that their, their vision's not as far out as yours. I would love to know what that is or what, what drink I could give them, but um, the creative ideas uh, for summer connection, but they come back in the last in September and they are a different person. What do I do? I, I mentioned it earlier is um, I have interviews. So, um, they come in, the first rehearsals, I just, you know, wipe out. Don't worry about coming in with getting hurry and getting on that end. I will say, every first rehearsal, whether you're teaching a class, a, uh, uh, if you're an adjunct at a university, or if you're doing something with your church, the first time you see a choir, they always need to sing. No one else spend a whole period, you know, running through the, the roster and running through the syllabi or talking about your expectations for the year and then never sing a note. They got to sing. But how you schedule these interviews, whether it's during rehearsal time or some other time, or maybe you do it the women one week, or you do it, it's spattered across a couple weeks, it is essential. Um, because it's in this meeting that you learn about what they're doing with regards to sports. Um, well, I'm going to be, I had a guy who was water polo. Now, who here knows what a water polo schedule looks like? Can I just tell you, it's awful with church. <laughs> um, Will uh, uh, was one of our youth, just an amazing, amazing young man uh, who, who was just faithful, but he was just a really good athlete. He's a great water polo guy, and, and they, they he commanded a lot of his time, so we missed him a lot. But, um, you know, but I will tell you in the end, he was making decisions between the two and was choosing choir and church. Um, it's really exciting. It's always like a yeah every time that happens, you know. Um, calendar. So let's let's talk as you're meeting with them. Let's talk about this is what we're looking at this year. Now, guys, this goes back to my morning session. You've already met with your ministers. You've already met with your youth pastor and your head pastor. You've you've got a sense of what the church rhythm of the year is going to be like, and you're aligning your plans with what you're doing with the choir. You've already set up your calendar of when they're think, you're thinking about having them sing the Sundays that they may sing. You've had worship planning six months out, incorporating your youth, thinking creative, all those things I've been talking about, so that when you meet them in the week after Jan uh, uh, Labor Day, there it is. There it is. Because you know why? Everywhere else they're going, those teachers and those coaches, there it is. It's like this little divvy fight for who gets it first, you know? Uh, get it on your calendar. But it's important. It really, really does help to have your dates ready and to ask them, Oh, mom and dad, or we're going to 
Oberama gal, we're going to do the big passion thing over in Germany for you know, for two weeks or a month or yeah. You know, what are the big dates that they may have that might be important for you to know uh, for them? What's going on at home? Um, yeah, so I think mom and dad are getting separated. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, grandma who lives with us, she's you know on her way out. You know, she's she's her health's declining. So and so has been diagnosed. Or, you know, those are the heavy hitters. But they're there. It's been a long time since you've seen them last. What's going on in the home? Um, maybe they're the youngest of three and they're the only one in them. They're the only child now. Maybe it's the sixth grader who's first time in the youth group. Um, what's the dynamic of the house? Um, I always love the title of some youth ministers. You see, they'll have youth minister, minister to, to youth or whatever. But I love minister to youth. You see titles that say youth and their families. That's a real title because that's really what it is. I'm not just, you know, they're, they, they're not just ministering to youth. It's the entire family that we're ministering to. Uh, we love all those kids. Um, and we, we manage all of that. Because um, this is going to be getting them to and from church. You know, it's that kind of stuff. It's good to know this in that interview time. And then there, of course, after you got all that information, the vocally, the vocalizing. And I would do this exercise. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that is scary. That is like, that is especially for a bass. Look at this. Huh? <laughs> well, I got tickled. Yeah, I know. I got tickled about it because uh, uh, it's just clip art. I just found the images, you know. But look at this thing with the slur and the, the accents and the dangry <laughs> shit. <laughs> right, that's another accent, bro. And then the slur. Anyway, it was very funny. I, just, I got tickled at that. But yeah, so then we get into the actual vocalizing. Guys, remember, the highest or lowest quote-unquote hit note does not prescribe a voice type. Let me say that again. The highest or lowest note they can sing does not prescribe a voice type. Man, he's got that really low bass, you know. But he's also got a lot of this up here, too. And just because he was able to hit that low note doesn't mean, oh, he's a bass. Or worse yet, I have no tenors. He's got a couple of those high notes, but he's really a bass, but he's going to sing tenor, you know. Do your best. Let that inform your repertoire selection. Maybe you're picking three parts <laughs> instead of four parts. You know? Um, but you need to let, because I, I will say, for me, vocal health in my youth is of paramount uh, concern. So I don't want to stress their voice and their instrument. I don't want them leaving feeling exhausted. Um, I've had some conferences and festivals where I've taken choirs and they come back, oh man, I just lost my voice. I mean, because I sat through their sessions, I've watched choir directors clinic, great clinicians. Come on, I need more of that forte. I need more, I need more, you know. And never once they say, that's it. Good job. <coughs> so as far as the youth knows, I just need to keep singing louder. Because he needs me to be louder. As opposed to saying, no, that's perfect. That's just right. That's so much better. Yeah, right. Uh, quick question on the vocalizing. Um, if it takes several weeks to get through meeting with everyone, so you have right, seven right, right. or eight of the choir, then, then um, what voice part do they sing so, in rehearsal? So what I do, what I really do, and of course this works really well for someone that's been already been at a church for a number of years, I kind of know where kids are. So I'm really, there's uh, occasionally, it's a good question. So if you're coming into a first time choir, never known anybody, it takes a minute. And I would really probably prescribe a retreat, like if you got a weekend kickoff retreat, where you can have a little bit more time, so you can start to really be T A S whatever. Um, but usually, like with, with my choir this year, I got a big flock of sixth graders coming in. That's what I'm going to really focus on. Um, but I still will listen to everybody's voice. Mm. So I need to start rehearsal. So I got my basses, my tenors, but I'm still going to listen to everyone because, as we all know, the changing is always happening. Um, so, you, but that, yeah. I, I think it's it's just it's hard to try to get it all in, but um, uh, but that's kind of what I will do this year at least. You know, I'll just listen to those that I've not heard yet, or anyone that's new to the choir. Um, and then, but it, throughout the course of those for that first month, I will listen to everybody. And it might be as simple as, hey, hey, Bobby, can you stay after this? You know, or you know, hey, wait one second. You know, and I try to do them in groups because sometimes they get a little nervous. You know, they get a little timid about it. Um, I might have the little. Little quartet, tri triplet of, of, of seventh grade girls sing all sing together. And we just we work on that and we talk about that. But I love to praise in those moments and they get confidence. Wow! 
Uh, did y'all hear that? Did you hear that? And I think that and you talk publicly with them in that boat, in that that voice, you know, the my country tis or whatever you want to do. But you you're working through with them publicly. So the building, con oh, oh, and, and we really sound good together too. You know, however you want to fashion it. But mm -hmm. that's it can be tough though getting everybody there, especially if they're not faithful and always there all the time. Um, Learning how to manage the tessitura and navigating registration events. That's key. That's a key element to telling you, prescribing you what voice type they might be. Um, you know, so it's not just the extremities of the notes, but it's also the transitions that you're listening for. What's the color and timbre of the voice? Is it rich and warm or is it bright? And, you know, that might help you as well to kind of get a sense of where they might be. Um, also, during the vocal change, I never assign a permanent part. Like, I think you're going to sing soprano for now. I always leave the door open. Um, don't ever do a scarlet letter, <laughs> you know, because some kid's going to walk into a college professor or a college studio or somewhere and say, I'm a tenor. Why? Well, because <laughs> my church choir director or my school teacher needed tenors, <laughs> but, but said that I was. And they're always thinking that's what they're supposed to be. I had a boys changed voice uh, ensemble called Cantare uh, in Charlotte and every rehearsal, every rehearsal they knew I might have a bass sing first tenor tenor might be singing baritone I was switching them around all the time now in the learning process that becomes problematic what it would, what it would, how it would look would be like the, the balance is not good with the baritones Tommy you're a good second, hey could you sing baritone there oh okay and they just got into the habit of knowing I'm all, we're always moving. Because when I'm working with boys from 7th or 8th grade to 12th grade, <laughs> they're always changing. Now, you do get the freaks. I'm a freak. I walked in in 7th, 8th grade. My voice just went, just, just plummeted. And I've been singing low C's and beyond ever since. But, but, but they still have really good falsettos. My baritones and basses can sing a first tenor line better oftentimes than a second tenor or, you know, just because they have that better mix and resonance in that falsetto head voice. So I'm always moving around. All right, basses, I want you all to sing the first tenor part. Or whatever the case may be. That was with a, mix, a, a, a male ensemble. But the same thing goes here. Keep them moving around. You know, those girls, you know, making sure. Also be sensitive when you have that girl that sings alto or soprano in her, church choir, in her school choir and you're having her sing alto. You can tell. Ooh, sometimes you can tell. They're just, there's just a body language that just... She's de she looks defeated. She comes to you and says, like, everything okay? Yeah. yeah, I had one girl that did that. She never told me what. Finally, I was able, a week or two, after a week or two, to pry it out of her. She goes, I just, I always sing soprano at school. And I'm so much more comfortable. Lucia, absolutely. Let's sing soprano. You know, I mean, we're not about forcing issues here. I mean, I'd rather have her there and join choir than have her filling a, a need in the alto section. Here we go. There he is. The cambiato, or the change <laughs> voice. Now, what was that song that they sang? The shot of all the love, whatever that, that little thing. She knows it. I almost linked the song, but I didn't. I almost did. So, you don't need to go watch the Brady Bunch. There is an entire episode where they're in a studio singing this song, and Peter Brady acts as the, uh, our sweet poor Peter Brady. His <laughs> voice breaks every time. So, the cambiata voice in a treble. <coughs> it's essential here that we spend as much time with them as possible. Uh, section rehearsals, sectional rehearsals, you know, uh, have the companies take the ladies away. I, it helps a little bit that, that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a man, I'm a male, because um, I can work with them, I understand what they're going through. But ladies, I'll also say it's helpful. I wish I was you sometimes in terms of a modeling standpoint. I really struggle. I'm a low, low bass, I'm a falso profundo. So my falsetto, ooh, it's really, it goes really low, like, really low and therefore my upper falsetto range is not that high so I can't sometimes model like I want to up there so I have to use the piano a lot and just and do the best I can of course I'm a great I my voice cracks and I, when I go up too high woo, and I do something that sounds funny they laugh and it's like hey it happens to them too it, it's it's um it's a time where you just need to love on them um can I just tell you it is, it is important that throughout the change you got to keep singing the head voice and the head voice throughout the change. Um, they will want to drop, they will want to go. Um, that's just because it's what's happening, but also they feel like that's what they're supposed to do. 
keep singing the head voice. Um, but in this middle school, this uh, treble choir, what middle school is like, if you have a middle school youth choir, you know, you're, this is what you're working with. Um, um, you know, and encourage them. Of course, watch your language. Watch your language. All right, ladies. All right, boys. That's not the world we're in, right? Um, it's really hard sometimes, especially if you're a director of an adult choir. Gentlemen, men, of course, unless you've got the, the, the alto tenor, the woman tenor. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's, you know, and I got several in my current choir. But usually we're, you know, with adults, we can kind of claim who we are, but then you stand in front of these little ones and, and these middle schoolers and, all right, boy, oh, uh, altos, all right, in my, or ones and twos, who are my threes? You know, uh, it's really important not to prescribe that for them, and it helps that environment. Um, repertoire selection is paramount here. You, you've got to watch uh, what you're choosing, especially with this middle school choir. Um, and it really depends on the kind of boys you have and the, the voices that you're working with. Um, sometimes two-part music's not all that great. Um, the, 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 if it sits around that, sometimes if it sits around the <coughs> C, B, C, middle C, D, and E, they're clueless on intonation and agility, all that kind of stuff. So either we engage the head high, you know, um, and, or, or have them sing something that's a little bit higher. Um, remember that these boys can be sopranos. They can be sopranos. Um, it, it goes that high. <laughs> and of course, they can be altos. Um, and that, you know, that, that's, uh, that, that's something that you just have to be cognizant of. There is range limitations within that changing voice. Um, know that uh, the change, um, I think, is happening sooner. I think it's happening sooner. I don't know if it's the steroid in the chicken or what, but um, uh, it's just, and they've been doing, there's all kinds of studies. You can research that. I saw a whole bunch of stuff. I just didn't put it on here. But there's a lot of studies that show that the change voice is happening sooner um, for all of us. Um, now, mixed ensembles. That's what I currently have at my church now. They were this, they're now this, and I might be going back to splitting. Uh, but if they're combined, um, I will tell you, just be very careful. Use the voice parts. Soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. <coughs> Gentlemen, I would like, or I'd like for you guys to see soprano or alto here. Can I also tell you what really helps that sometimes is to say to the cambiata voice, could you, could you, I need, I need this, I, women, I, I need to strengthen that part. Can you give me some more volume? Can you guys sing that? Help them, <clears throat> right? I also have the tenor and basses, the, the, the guys, the high school guys. I have them sing with them. They got falsettos too. They haven't lost them. So, gentlemen, I just need you all to sing. Can you sing soprano and alto here? Uh, we just did, oh, wow. Yeah, that's it. That is great. Um, so what that does, it, it just, it, it wipes away that macho <coughs> testosterone line that we love to draw. What's really, but I'm going to tell you, if you want to pounce in a rehearsal, of course, I'm a big praise in public, criticize in private, but watch it. If these high school boys start laughing, giggling, snickering, and doing, nip that quick. And, and, and I will say sometimes it's better to do it privately than if they do it, because then if I, no, 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 you don't, no, 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 in front of them, all that does is just call more attention to it. Um, sometimes just let it go. If you can do it non-verbally, that's always great. Um, and then after the rehearsal, hey, guys, can I, can I see y'all for a second? Look, you were there too, <laughs> right? And we need you to help them get to where you are now. Can you undergird them, encourage them, help them out, you know? But those are the things that you got. That's just what we're dealing with, with high schoolers and the middle schoolers, um, as in, in that mixed environment. Um, that will help diminish the stereotypes they do provide you, I will say, one of the byproducts of this is a stronger tenor section. So I was in a split ensemble before I came to South Maine and I joined and they were combined. It's like, wow, I've got tenors now, you know, if I am doing an SATV. And if the if the changed voice can navigate wherever that, and of course that repertoire selection, where does that tenor voice sit? You know, if it's sitting again around the middle C, D, and E, which oftentimes they do, you know, it can be problematic. Um, but I have them either map up, sing with the altos, or but you just work through that. Um, and I got some examples of some things that will encourage that I'll, I'll play for you uh, here in just a second. Um, uh, there it is. Remember uh, this right here. That rowdy boy that was your seventh uh, or eighth grade kid that was just 
crazy? Remember that boy who gave you nightmares about when he worried about what he might be like when he gets older. Don't lose hope in him or cast any permanent judgment because they often can become your leading singer and or behavior monitoring leader. Um, I can't tell you, I mean, you guys have served enough true youth choirs. You probably have seen it happen enough where you thought, oh my gosh, what's this kid going to be like when he gets older? And inevitably what happens? Great. Beautiful. I mean, these swans of kids come out. Uh, leading, thinking, helping, you know, developing depth in your choir. Uh, it's just just, un just unfathomable how these kids can do that. So when you're stressed with those young ones and they're going crazy, they're acting more like that guy there on the end, um, don't lose hope. And I would say often uh, tell them that you think so. Tell them that you know you are a leader. As you can see it. You know it. You've seen it happen before. Tell them, even if sometimes you don't believe it, <laughs> say it anyway. Say it anyway and encourage them. Give them attainable and achievable goals. Call them in rehearsal for a positive example. Uh, I gave some examples of that at the earlier session this morning. Praise in public, criticize <coughs> in private. Criticizing in private, I learned from another, I love watching children's choir directors because they're just awesome at that. Okay, guys. Okay, so, you know, they're so good at that kind of thing. Sometimes private isn't uh, outside the door after rehearsal. It can just be in the side. Um, all right, right back to it. it it's it's just a it's a, just a reminder that, that what they do not respond well to, as you all well know, Susie, you need to you know, just uh, gets us nowhere. Be encouraging. Uh, that Fraka Hassman quote from this morning, you know, we should never, as conductors, take away the love of, of, of music making from our singers. That's you know, we should never try strive or, or ever uh, uh, do that to them. Um, the stresses of our kids, as you remember, so not just the voice changing, but they're dealing with family, boyfriends, girlfriends, teachers, coaches, bad grades, all present themselves in their attitude and their posture. You can see it when they walk in the door. And I will also tell you, especially in their voice. You can feel and hear and sense all of those stresses that they're carrying. We have to love them through those times. We have to love them through those times evoking a lot of what we talked about in our uh, uh, worship session about encouraging and fostering future leaders. Um, what about you? What are some issues that you've dealt with or questions that you might have or ideas with that changed voice as we think about the singer specifically? Anything? Curious, one of the things that I do, I, um, um, I put, uh, assign the chairs, like a sixth grade voice sits here. Um, and then, and I always put the sixth graders or seventh graders closest to the women's section, but still in the men's section. And I will mm. tell them, I want you to, here, here's the tenor part, but if you hear a part of the room that fits your voice better, sing that one instead. You can mm. help the choir out by doing that. And they're sitting right next to the octaves and many times they'll just, that, it, it fits their voice it better, so they just voice. sing this way. But yet they're sitting in the men's section. Right, right. They're so on the edge. It, so it, it feels good. Signing the seats. Anybody else? That's good. Any success stories? Anybody here do the four A requiem? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Chichester. Right? Um, it's it's happened. Uh, we it happened in Providence. We did the four A, and um, and a boy, uh, literally, bless his heart. I'm telling you, he was probably a week away. Like I mean, we were. <laughs> I was sweating uh, of his change, of his transition. I mean, he, I mean, he just, it was just, oh man, we, you just knew it was coming. And literally, I think a month later it happened. Um, I didn't, it, it, you know, I'm sure it was recent, but um, anybody, any other ideas about the, the specific changes you've experienced as, in singers? One other element that we've not talked about, but we talked a lot about the cambiata. It's what you think of when you think of change singer, you think of that. Can I just say the attitude and the environment of what it's like to be a junior in high school? <coughs> Guys, let me tell you right now, that is the most stressed youth in your youth group, is a junior in high school. Junior, not a senior, a junior. They are the ones who are stressing over what school they're going to go to. That's when the grades and the SATs are really starting to kick in. That's when they're taking their AP courses and they've got all those end of year, whatever, all that stuff. 
by the time they're seniors, things are pretty much well in hand. There's stress and applications going on in the fall, but we're just waiting to hear back. Um, and maybe some senior exit projects and things of that nature, but it's those in junior year. Um, with the seniors, though, there is senioritis. I put it in my little blurb there. You know, it does happen. Um, I used to get really upset about that, <laughs> and I guess I still do. I get disappointed. Um, can I just say this? Choir it and everything. And that's hard sometimes for us to say. There is a life outside of youth choir <laughs> or church. <laughs> um, and my wife is a very good reminder of that for me a lot of times. As I get, I come home, I'm like, I can't believe so, I can't believe she, you know, hey, you know, there's, there's a world out there. There's a whole other thing that they're experiencing. It's, you know, choir, want, we want that to be all that they experience and enjoy, but it is just a small part of their entire experience as youth. Um, but we just have to love on them through all of that. So, any other thoughts before we move on to the next change? I do have one question. Oh, yeah. um, I have a couple of boys that in order to stay in a comfortable range, <laughs> find a comfortable range that is not anywhere near the key yeah. that we're actually in. So you need to spend some <laughs> lovely private time with them, giving them the finger. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just that it's it. There really is, there's no pretty way to woodshed with someone who's having trouble with pitch. Um, it, you just really have to encourage them a lot, praise them a lot. Hey, you're getting really closer to that one note that we spent the past <laughs> two minutes trying to find. I... And, and you have to really scale it down to that. Um, are you listening? Are they hearing the pitch inside? Um, and this is where, if it's a boy, it really helps to have a male, male, yeah. male uh, um, mentor. a mentor or a, a mirror model for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's just there's, that's not going to happen publicly in the rehearsal. No. Sometimes it might, like with what Randy was saying, they find. Sometimes that will happen. Mm -hmm. But but for someone who's really fishing, yeah. Yeah. I do a little bit of. Um, that's here, and once I can get them on the pitch, that's here, and if it's a half tone, I might do like this, and then the step. So if you can help use their body, and if they're in the middle of the choir, mm -hmm. I have this in both my adult and my high school mm -hmm. youth yeah. choir, and I had an adult, and I would just go, and they they'd get up there, and they read the language, you know, just. Oh. See, I, I do that I with vowels, that. but I never thought about that with actual intonation issues mm -hmm. about uh, you know, using gestures to say you're, you know, beyond the, <laughs> the finger. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, kinesthetic use is key. Remember guys, it's, we don't have a tactile instrument. No, and I constantly, my husband is always in my youth choir practices sitting with the guys. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, well, I, that's, that's a good point too. Yeah, volunteers. Because I folks. can't model the male voice, right. of what it sounds like, and I need mm -hmm. him too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I have um, section leaders for my adult choir. Good. <coughs> oh, you I use your my... section leaders of your adult choir? Well, no, I have Which like is... young hip people from yeah, yeah. the adult yeah. choir that come and do. Um, young and hips work. Yeah, I right? do. <laughs> Younger and hipper than me, but I love climbing. But yeah. yeah for no, that's, for that's me, my husband, because I only have four guys. He usually ends up singing because my basses are still insecure. Mm -hmm. My little, my two rising sixth graders are okay. I really have to watch what music I choose. But if I can get my son to come, who's a real tenor, and he's mm -hmm. 22, so they're like, I'm oh, singing yeah. job, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, then Dan can help the guys, but every time we go to sing, he'll go, "Do you need me?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who say, "Yeah." yeah. Yeah. So, and I'll just look at them and go, and sing a song. <laughs> well, I'm going to move on and keep going. These are great ideas and, and, uh, and all, all good, all, all very good. Um, we change too. Did y'all realize that? Um, here we go. Are you ready for this? This is great. Isn't that cool? Look at that. There he is. There we are. And yes, notice the hair adjustment that takes place in that progression. Um, I, um, 
I was just reminded of this, uh, and, I, and I read a book, uh, or I was reminded of a, of a source called by Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. The title of the book is Falling Upward. Anybody read this? Um, in it, he talks about spiritually perspectives of, of successes and failures. And what he says is in this part of our life, we are pumped with a lot of successes. Our, our, our um, validity, purpose, and drive is built by all of these wonderful achievements. And then something happens right about where I am personally in my life. Where someone comes to me, man, Carrie, that, that was a great, great gift. And for me, I'm like, it's good to hear. It is great to hear, but, but I'm no longer leaning on. Like, I don't, okay, yeah, I've done the work, done the large work. We've been, we've, we've, I've had that before, you know. So what starts to shape me here isn't the, the success anymore. It's failures. I mean, obviously all the way through, failure is, is a formative part of what we do. Roar says that at some point in our life, we start to do this, where all of a sudden you're more mature, you're more experienced, you've seen the world a bit. So when you these, these failures happen or things that don't quite go, those become real formidable teaching lessons, learned moments. You know, they always are, but, but it's not so much the successes. So... Case in point, yesterday the boy that conducted the Oba Seja, great job. And I went to him and I said, buddy, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah, we just had this great conversation, poured into him. And he's going to get that for the next 10, 15 years of his life. He's going to go to, he's going to be constructively <coughs> criticized through his, maybe a major if he goes to music, because that's what we do when we're musicians. We get you know, nitpicked all through our, our, our learning. But, but he's going to get a lot of praise. He's going to get a lot of praise. There's going to come a point in his ministry maybe, where all of a sudden that praise kind of stops, sort of. That kind of happened to me. You know, I, I got so, uh, you know, all these accomplishments and wonderful achievements, and then there comes a point where it's like, that, those kind of stop, <laughs> you know, and, and then it's like, oh. And, and um, that's an interesting transition that Rohr talks about in this book. I thought it was kind of interesting um, uh, as we think about our, our relationship. I also think about how we relate to our youth. When I first had my first youth choir, I was 23, 23, 24. They, they were, these little kids, I was, I was just a, a buddy with them. I mean, we were, you know, I was just four or five years away from some of these potential college grads and, you know. And now, as I'm at South Main with two kids, it's a bit more parental. I'm, I'm starting to see these kids a little differently and they're starting to see me a little differently. My jokes aren't as funny anymore. Um, I have to start reading Rolling Stone magazine to try to find out what's hit. Is it off the chain or is it off the hook? I don't know. Um, and that's even so five, six years ago. Um, and then I've heard colleagues of mine. Come grandfathers. That's what happens. You know, buddies who've been going through this their whole life, especially at the same church, all of a sudden, you know, Randy's got these cool stories of, moms who have kids who are in his court. He has their kids, but he also directed their parents, which is just beautiful. Um, they see you as a granddad. And I've heard some folks say that's probably, of all the seasons of their lives as directors, probably one of the best uh, experiences is this time when, when you've been through so many decades of, of directing youth. But bottom line, we are changing. But here are some ideas and thoughts to think about. As directors, are we projecting unneeded stress on our choir? Are we projecting expectations of past choirs on new choirs? Are we projecting uh, new expectations on an old choir? You know, new concepts. And, you know, maybe you've been at this choir for a long time, but you really want to do something. You know, we just have to be careful with what we project and expect from our ensembles. Um, this became to my mind most recently because I moved churches. When you transition from one church to another, you experience this. I get haunted by Thad Roberts. Who knows Thad Roberts? I worked for it. Yeah. <laughs> I get haunted by old Thad. There he is. This is South Main Baptist Church Youth Choir. Um, In what these year? pictures. 1958. Something. Probably. Yeah, I think so. These pictures exist. I think somebody, I asked, it, somebody, asked somebody, um, let's see, Thad started the Children's Choir program fall of 1955 and died January of 87. Thomas Coker came in 87 and he retired on October 12th. So 32 years for one and, and then another 30 or so for the other. 
I entered into this position and they said, we welcome you, we're glad you're here and called here for the next era of music ministry in <laughs> South Bay. They used that word. Yeah. I kid you not, I about... <laughs> um, so they don't change very often there. But here I am, and these photos are all over our history books and all over the church framed. And, and so I'm constantly staring at them, and they're kind of daunting. Like, i got 40 kids, so my choir encompasses this right here, you know? And, um, and there's always, it's not always about numbers and growth, but, you know, just be mindful of that was great for that day. You know why? Because Houston and South Main was a suburb at that time. Now South Main is urban. <laughs> it's right smack in the middle of the city. Demographics change. Geographic stuff changes. The, you know, the, 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 the paradigm shifts. Choirs are different today than they were in other days. You know, let's not carry that baggage. Can I, can I tell you something? Because I think it, it's very applicable what you're doing. Because yeah. I was associate music minister for, for dads. Awesome. I mean, well, I was a teenager, but um, the, he, he found this magical way of doing music ministry. Because he was he was on the cutting edge, he right. was out there with the sparks. He wrote the book, but then, but then he institutionalized it. Yeah, and and so twenty five years later, he's doing music ministry exactly the way they did in nineteen fifty eight. Never, never changed. And never changed. And so I I, I guess it's thing that's why what you're talking about is so important because we you have to keep changing. You can't institutionalize right. where you are. That's a good point. That's a and. and and that's what we say, that's what we know, but I think it's just good to remember and remind us. But the hard part is being in the midst of that change. We've got to self-actualize. We've got to pull ourselves away and kind of look at us from a distance and say, where are we? How are we doing? How am I doing? Um, my transition from Providence to South Maine, uh, you know, Thomas was there for a number of years, as I stated. I learned to embrace their old traditions, but slowly also introduce new ones. Um, I mentioned the ordination tradition that they've done, the singing for the deacons ordination that you guys have heard. Um, they've always had a small ensemble as a part of the larger choir. It's called Maranatha. You know, that's a tradition that we keep. Take what they give you and run with it, right? Be flexible, bendable, but not breakable. You want a spine that can bend but not break in, in, in this whole aspect of directing. The next question is, are we improving, are you improving as a minister of music and a director or a conductor? Take classes, private lessons. <coughs> Steve is on me, my pastor, because um, vocal performance and singing was my thing. That's how I identified myself. I was a, 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 just a bass soloist. When I started going into conducting, and next thing you know, I'm, I'm in front of large groups of youth, or I'm in big rehearsals, or from university to church to community, whatever. I was using this and modeling this, and all of a sudden, I, my voice was, I was losing the chops. Um, we, I'm seeing shaking heads, so you guys know what I'm talking about. And my, my pastor said, I kind of transparently said, I need help. I need someone to keep me accountable with that. And so he's, he's, home, he's keeping, he checks with me every so often. Have you found a coach yet in Houston? Either U of H or Rice. Some, I'm, I'm, I'm in the search for someone that I'm going to work with just to keep, keep my chops up. Um, video your rehearsals. How many of y'all do that? You should. That thing right there should be in your rehearsal regularly and not just because not don't do but make sure you explain why so the church the, the choir didn't think oh he must be looking for another job because he's, uh, <laughs> he's, getting, he's getting footage of his rehearsal it's not what it is it's that we're honing our skills we can be better watch one of your rehearsals take some medicine and maybe a stiff drink and watch the rehearsal because you're going to be very critical of yourself but it is so informative on how we can improve in our rehearsals um Go to conferences like, I don't know, Hallelujah. Um, I mentioned earlier about a counselor that does verbatims. Look into that. Take your ministerial team, select one of you who does hospital visits, and go and take and do a verbatim. It's tough because they, they break down how you could have improved in the conversation with the parishioner or a conflict, a, a resolution issue. But it's a wonderful way to learn how to be better ministers, asking the right questions. I want to move on, and finally, to the changing choir. Um, they ain't the same as they once were. Um, but let me speak, speak specifically to the structure of a choir, combining or splitting. South Main was for many years a split choir. During the interim, they, when they were searching for the position, they combined because they needed to. 
Um, and the numbers kind of lend, 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 lend them toward that. But now, I'm now considering a need to split them again because the choir, uh, the dynamic, the numbers, um, all, the, all that kind of stuff is, is starting to change again. So I'm always thinking, like I've got this big honking group of fifth graders coming into sixth, so I might split this group this year. I don't know, I'm, I'm processing about that. I'm taking some of the ideas I've heard today from you all uh, that you've shared. Um, the philosophy was different from one church to the other. Um, the philosophy of, of mission trips and tours. South Maine has in every other trip to we go to Peru, which I love, because it's not just a drive-by mission trip. It's something we're building relationships, partnering with them. Um, but South Maine is not the mission construction, build a house kind of choir tour that they would do at uh, mission trips in Charlotte. It's a very different kind of dynamic of what they expect. South Maine has an urban, rural, global experience. You know, and so going back to that projecting, be careful not to force something that's not already, that's not in their DNA, you know. Um, and you got to be willing to flex with that. Um, choirs carry different expectations uh, and not just their genre of music and ability. Um, you know, that choir was accustomed to traveling the world, this one isn't. Um, this choir is in a very affluent area and this one is an inner city urban church that carries folks from all over the, the city. Um, South Maine has a pretty large scholarship base. Like, there's a, we got a lot of kids that go up that have on scholarships for choir tours and things because they need it. You know, Providence and Charlotte, it was a affluent area. And you have one or two kids that might need a scholarship. So, so budget wise, whoa. <laughs> like, that really, have now got a lot more families that can't afford these trips. And so that, that plays in decisions and processes, you know, as you were planning. Um, that choir struggled with clicks, but this choir doesn't. Um, I've talked with Kevin. He entered into this youth group uh, seven some odd years ago. Uh, where the youth were then, theologically, they are different than where they are now. And we kind of stepped back and said, hey, do you still need to teach those kind of classes anymore? I don't think you do. I think these kids got it because they've been getting it since sixth grade. You know, oh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it is something. I mean, they're always changing, um, and we should always be cognizant of that. Um, uh, mentioned earlier, that choir was a suburban, easy to get to church. This is kind of the difference, like we're both in Houston, but Randy's Tallowood uh, versus our South Main Urban. The commute's a little different. Um, you know, my choir in Charlotte represented eight to ten high schools, but, but <coughs> the choir here in Houston, close to thirty. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm not joking. Like, it's that many schools, which is interesting if you think about the dynamic. As that youth group comes into rehearsal. Uh, from a suburban group where they only are a few, they're at a few schools where you've got a clique of about seven that all go to the same school, or six or eight or ten that go to the same, they bring that baggage from that school to that youth group, which can be sometimes a bad thing. My South Main Choir uh, group, I, I'm representing my school. <laughs> so as I show up, I'm a, you know, there's no baggage, there's no, does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. So it's, so the, the dynamic of relationship within the group is so much better because of that. Um, that choir wore tuxes, this choir's t-shirts and shorts. Whatever. Uh, the youth minister staff um, uh, changes also can affect culture. Um, so be mindful of that um, as, as, you're, uh, as you're going through. Uh, just be careful and be sensitive to the youth about that. That can be very troubling. Um, repertoire selection. Um, you know, it changes. Guys, don't just because a piece was cool back in the day, doesn't mean it still is. Pieces can get dated and old and washed up, move on. And some of those great ones will be great forever. This is a new piece. We've done it. You've heard it uh, recently. But this is Obas Eje. Um, what I love about this piece, uh, Chris Ospas transcribed it from a Mission Can Believe performance. Uh, it's a Nigerian folk song. You heard it yesterday. What I love about it is the way it stacks the chords, it stacks the parts rather, so you get different parts. This is a men's group. Woo! Those little first, those little. So I did this with my boys first, and then the girls got jealous. We were, so I didn't go back to Chris Osbos's page and find the SATV version. But this was great for my copy out of my boy, changing boys. They love this. And, and, you know, it's just got that drive, the solo comes out. Um, 
Anyway, just as you're looking at repertoire, find a repertoire that's going to embrace those changed voices, but give some energy, you know, and off to it. Now here I had a dancing, you know, so they're doing this, they're doing all this kind of crazy stuff, you know, whatever, shouting and doing. Um, and <laughs> when we presented it to the church and worship for Advent, it's, here comes the king in the translation. When we presented it, um, I had just, you know, I had, I needed some more oomph in the sound, so I asked uh, my men for the adult choir at a men's ensemble of about eight, six or so. They joined me. So I had these old men doing this dance, and uh, it is the most beautiful thing. Um, the children were lined up in the foyer to come in for the processional when they were doing this for the prelude, and somebody took a cell phone clip of the kids in their robes doing the dance in the foyer. Um, it was just a beautiful day of worship. Um, Engaging and embracing the, 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 the issues that we sometimes deal with, um, with the, the changed voice. Um, but, uh, but in this case, it was a complete and huge success. Um, so uh, that's it uh, on that. I, I want to talk about a question I want to ask you about choirs today. Are they this, you know, the statement I was going to say, the choirs of today aren't the same, or are they? The communication has changed. You all may be aware of that. I know you are, but you just need to be, con you just need to be cognizant of that. Um, we must use all mediums of communication. Facebook, Twitter, texting. Uh, Randy made a good point earlier. I do email, as I dawned on me, the emails that go out from me go to the parents, not to the kids. Mm -hmm. So the kids really don't do email. Written, verbal, handwritten notes are, are key. Um, while the cell phone and its many apps is a frontier still to be discovered, our youth are still youth, and they need parameters on that. So I mentioned that in the other session. Um, be mindful. Here's a little tidbit I did some research on. A guy by the name of Clay Shirky is a professor. He's, his studies show how we really aren't effective at all while we multitask. He wrote, he writes about the uncontrollable gravitation towards certain emotionally triggering content. As an example, your former lover tagged a photo you're in. Versus the Crimean War was the first conflict significantly affecting the use of the telegraph. Spot the difference, he says. One has an immediate emotional payout, the other is a slow release. The coupling of the content and the images make it doubly distracting, he says. Our visual and emotional systems are faster and more powerful than our intellect. We are given to automatic responses when either system receives the stimuli, much less both of them. Asking a student to stay focused while she is alert on their phone is like asking a chess player to concentrate while wrapping their knuckles with a ruler at unpredictable, at unpredictable intervals. Get the phones away from rehearsal. And I said it earlier, either you have a box on front or a buddy of mine uses the uh, shoe, uh, women have the shoe, plastic shoe things that you hold your shoes in. It's great, hanging on the back of the door and they come in, whoop, that's where the phone goes. Um, they can't have an engaging intellectually and stimulating experience if they got that going on all the time. Ask the question, when is it best for the youth choir to meet? Back in the day in Thad's day, it was different, right? When's it best for today? Is that still changing? What's best for your church and your youth group? Um, the, uh, the, you know, uh, the demands of our schools and the extracurriculars uh, have changed. Commutes weren't as far back then as they are now. Uh, or maybe they are if you're a church that's in a suburban area instead of urban. You know, those kinds of things you just got to be cognizant of. Um, <coughs> the decision for staffs and churches to have youth choir is a serious and difficult decision. It requires a legitimate process of discernment. What's the best time to meet? How regular will they perform? Those things have got to be discerned as you enter into that year. That all being said, youth still need to be challenged. By their nature, they want to be more mature and experienced than they really are. I think I've said this at every session. <laughs> so talk up to them. Challenge them musically, behaviorally, missionally. Give them more responsibility. I love the stories of Randy Edwards talking about asking some of his older boys to be the uh, room checkers. What? That's a chaperone's job, right? No, give it to the youth. They're responsible. You know, that's their responsibility. They will rise to that occasion. But you have to build up to that and scaffold yourself to that kind of responsibility. Um, they need to experience teamwork. They need to be loved. They still, all these changes that have happened, our youth still have social pressures. They still need to be loved and they still want to be a part of something bigger than themselves.